Thank you, Dan. Our next speaker is Pat Henderson, who uh, is a beef and forage producer, lives about 60 miles west of here. Uh, this is the hometown hero of this panel, I guess. And uh, Pat is representing the National Association of Conservation Districts. So help welcome Pat. I want to open by just asking you a simple question. Is the glass half empty or is it half full? Because how you answer that question in your head and in your heart is going to have a lot to do with how you approach the next few years. And we've all got to look at, as NACD does, this glass being half full. So on behalf of NACD and the 3,000 districts across this country, we appreciate the opportunity to be here and to try to give you our thoughts for just a few minutes on two questions. What are the problems as we see them and how can our organizations work together to solve those problems? Now, our, our role in this whole process is to put working lands put conservation on working lands in this country. We've got a lot of partners that we work with, but that's the goal of your conservation district back in your home. So let's look at those questions. I said about, you know, you really didn't get the first team here. You invited our president, and he and I are close friends, and he lives in Wyoming, and I live 60 miles from here. So he wondered if I could fill in for him. And I was more than happy to do that because, as you could, as you could tell from my bio, I'm in the, I'm in the grass-growing business, and I sell it through cattle. But unfortunately for me and for this whole agriculture community, that man, Olin Sims, was killed in a tragic farm accident. And so it's with some uh, bittersweet moments that I stand here today. But I did set about to try to poll our members and see what are the problems as they saw it. So this is not just me talking, but this is the whole NACD family. Now, there were a number of problems mentioned. Air quality was one that didn't make the top three. Climate change is another that didn't make the top three. So I'm going to zero in on three areas that I think and that we think are, are most important. The first is water quantity. The quantity of water is very important to us as agriculture producers. If you think, I was, I'm an old agriculture teacher years ago, and I remember going to these FFA speaking contests, and I started hearing these crazy people from out in the West talk about water problems. I mean, that's 20, 25 years ago. And as I got on some of these national boards, I realized that water is a real, it's a real fight. It used to be out in the West. It ain't just a Western problem anymore, is it? Ask the folks in Atlanta, Georgia. Ask the people one county away here in Oldham County, Kentucky, who had to, couldn't water their yards or wash their cars this past summer. So this whole idea of water is really significant. Now, the, the World Future Society identified 53 trends now shaping the future. I'll tell you this so you'll know what a deep thinker I am, but I was able to get hold of this study, and the interesting thing to me is that they, in thinking about the whole implication for the world, identified several factors affecting agriculture. And the most interesting of all was the fact that they didn't identify oil, running out of oil as our biggest problem, but rather running out of water. Think about that. I never would have thought when I was a young lad back down here in the hills of Kentucky that I should have sold everything I had and borrowed all I could have borrowed 
and started bottling water, and I'd be a millionaire or a multimillionaire standing before you instead of a poor old farmer. But it's true for all of us, isn't it? You paid more for the last gas you bought than you're going to pay for a bottle of water in this hotel, right? Water quantity is very significant. So what can we do about it? Well, you know, we've got to make water available to our folks. One's a matter of water rights, and the other's a matter of, of giving them some infrastructure to be able to get water. We've got the EQIP program that for livestock producers, uh, by law, has to have 50% of the money going to livestock, doesn't it? In Kentucky, we're very fortunate. We have a, the state's attorneys general settled a tobacco settlement deal, and there was a bunch of money sent back to the state. Since we lost a lot of tobacco income, we were a big part of that settlement. We were able to go to our general assembly and they're meeting right now, so Larry, I hope we still have luck. We're able to get 50% of those dollars allocated for agriculture, for building up the infrastructure of agriculture. And we've been able to put in a lot of water projects with those things. You know, I'm involved in a livestock rotation program at home, and one of the keys to that, Don, is having water located in those paddocks, isn't it? So we got to have those kinds of programs. I'm going to talk in a minute about how you can help with that. Besides water quantity, another very important problem is water quality. And I think you have to differentiate these, these problems, not just say water, because they're two very different problems. You know, right outside this room here, you've got a big river called the Ohio River. Starts up at Three River Stadium, Pittsburgh. Taxi in down there about the end of this state at Paducah into the Mississippi. The Missouri comes down. They go down into New Orleans. It gives us this great ability to have cheap transportation to move our products from the center of the country down, doesn't it, in our big grain-producing areas. But in producing that grain, you know, we are part of the problem with the fact there's a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico or the fact that there's a dead zone in Lake Erie. Let me go back to, to water quantity for just a minute. Another important challenge that I aim to mention to you about water quantity is this simple question I have for you. There's a lot of unintended consequences to what we do. We know that we're trying to produce more alternative energy, that we got boys fighting and girls, fighting and dying in Iraq and Afghanistan right now, that we recognize that we can't, we got to do something about this dependency. But a challenge and maybe an opportunity for this group, if we move, for example, to corn, to 150, 200 bushel corn, the kind of corn yields you're going to have to have to make money at in producing ethanol, for one example, soybeans for another. But as we move to that, we know corn takes tremendous quantities of water. So could an unintended consequence of going to, trying to replace this alternative energy be that we really strain, put extra strains on our water quantity? That's a question I just have to ask for you. Now, in terms of water quality, we know it's important, and we know that agriculture is a part but not the whole problem with agriculture. Uh, well, so what I'd say to you is we have to have some data, some hard data. You can't argue on emotion, folks. You got to argue with facts. Several years ago, we heard that there was an atrazine problem in Kentucky, and, and our state conservation associations set up some money to do some water well testing and get a baseline on what was there. And, you know, what we really found out, there wasn't too much of a problem after all, not as much as we've been led to believe. We need that kind of information. Now, let's move on. I'm going to run out of time to the third area I want to talk to you about. 
and you can call it by several different names. Loss of open space, urban sprawl, suburbanization, conversion of farmland, it's all the same thing. It's taking this good ground that we've got, productive ground, and it's turning into concrete parking lots and asphalt parking lots and shopping centers and houses. That's what farmland conversion is. And it has a lot of good things that happen as a result of that. People get housing, people get jobs, people get a place to shop, but it also has some unintended consequences. It hurts our wildlife, it hurts our environment. You know, one of the things we have to understand is that a lot of these issues are, are related to us, aren't they, folks? You know, you pour a concrete parking lot, it hurts the air quality, it hurts the water quality, as well as taking up land. So this leads me to the second question. What can you do? What can this group do to help groups like NACD that I represent and these other folks? And I, I guess I would sum it up in three words. Communicate, communicate, communicate. We have got to do a better job at communicating. Our problem in agriculture, I'm convinced, is that we spend too much of our time preaching to the choir. In fact, that's what I'm doing now, aren't I? Y'all already pretty much agree with what I'm going to say here. But we've got three groups that we have to target. And we don't always target them exactly the same way. The first group is you've got to hit the producers like me. You got to hit the producers and put these good techniques on the ground, whether they're conservation techniques, economic techniques, whatever. You got to convince the producers to utilize them. Second, you got to convince the non farmers, not that it's helping the farmers. They don't give a darn about that. You got to convince them it's helping them. It's helping them by helping their way of life. It's helping them by giving them clean air, clean water, whatever. You got, we got to talk in terms of what they want. Salesmen learned that long ago. It's a lesson we have to learn in agriculture. The third group we got to talk to is we got to talk to, how do you say it, the policy makers, the appropriators. Sometimes they call them the politicians. We got to talk to those, and we've got to have facts to talk to them about. We've got to have facts, folks. Hard core facts. And there's no, there's no substitute for it. Another thing that you, your group can do is you can help take this means and medians and modes and replications and all that scientific jargon that's used in the research world, and you can translate that into a, a means of communicating, again, with these three groups, the farmers, the non-farmers, and the appropriators. We, we think it's great that they set policy, but, Don, what we really want is their money, isn't it? So it's the appropriation angle that we're very interested in. So you, then in summary, have got three problems I'm going to identify for you. Water quantity, water quality, and urban sprawl. And what you can do is you can talk. Help us come up with good information to, to talk about. And you can also communicate with those folks that are so important. I want to leave you with, uh, with one thought from Albert Einstein. He said, and I, th I thought it was very telling, the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created the problem. So we have got to change how we think and how we approach things as we, if we're going to be successful. And I know we will be successful.
Thank you.